Hello everyone and welcome to MobyCon's next webinar, uh, The Principles of Traffic Calming. Uh, in a few moments you will start hearing from our consultants Leonard Nout and Mary Elbeck, uh, transatlantic call. So we've got Leonard here in studio with us and Mary calling from Durham, North Carolina. Uh, so welcome again. Uh, just like the last webinars that we've been running, we will be using Menti tonight. Uh, so make sure that you're logged on and you'll see the code shortly. Uh, if you have any questions, please make sure to enter them through Menti as well, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Uh, but before we get started, we are going to ask a couple questions uh, through Menti, so make sure you're logged in now. So the first question is, what profession do you identify with most? And so if you can give us a sense of where you're coming from, what your background is, that will uh, help us in terms of making sure we're answering the right questions in the right way as we get forward with the presentation. I'll give a couple minutes for that. There's always a little delay between YouTube and us live in the studio. So we are seeing some results, just not on our screen, <laughs> um, which is fine. We can figure that out. Uh, but we're seeing we've got some traffic engineers, some planners, some advocates, and some urban designers. So a pretty good cross-section. Unfortunately, you can't see it. <laughs> um, but we'll go to the next question. Uh, we'd like to know whether or not you've been to the Netherlands before. And so we've got yes, no, or not yet, hopefully waiting for uh, flights to open up again. We're getting some results. Again, we'll figure out the menti on, the, on your screen as we go through, hopefully. Uh, but in the meantime, lots of you have been here, which is great, which means you've experienced the infrastructure that uh, Mary and Leonard are going to talk about today. Not many haven't been here yet, but a few would like, well, a few of you haven't been and would still like to come. Um, okay, so we know we're not, uh, you've got some experience of what you're about to hear. Okay, so I'm going to pass it on over to Leonard now to give you a brief intro and enjoy the webinar. Thanks, Melissa, and welcome everybody uh, to this webinar on uh, traffic calming. Um, Today we're going to talk about traffic calming, all the ins and outs at a network level and a street level. But I always, always like to start this presentation with, uh, with a little anecdote. Um, on, the, on the PowerPoint you'll be, that you'll be able to see in two seconds. There we go. Um, this is a street close to my, uh, my mother's house. It is a rural road along the canal near Delft. And this was a road that was very busy. It's, it's quite narrow, uh, not quite suitable for the amount of traffic it was taking because every time the, the adjacent motorway uh, was uh, backed up or was uh, heavy traffic, people would use this as a bypass. So it was a lot of through traffic, people speeding along this narrow road with not quite um, appropriate bicycle facilities. So you can imagine that the residents of this road were really fed up. It was very unsafe. And the city tried to figure out what to do. Um, and there was not a lot of options. Like expanding the, the dike would be very expensive. Putting in a parallel route was not quite what they wanted to do. Um, so they decided that some traffic calming was in place. They studied on a few options, and this, this came out to be the best option. What you see is a moving, movable bollard. So every, every time the bollard goes up, nobody can pass through. And then you have to wait till the bollard drops down, and one car can go through at a time. Now you can imagine that this is quite a strange context for a traffic calming treatment like this, but it is highly, highly efficient. Um, because this bollard, um, in, in rush hour, it would only drop once every 35 seconds. Now you can imagine day one, traffic backs up on the motorway, people expect to take their, their normal uh, shortcut route along this, this dike, and they end up waiting for this traffic light for, for 35 seconds for one car to pass. Day one, traffic was horrific, about an hour, hour and a half delay, just on these two, three kilometers of, of, of roadway. Um, second day, almost no delay. Third day, traffic was gone. Uh, what I want to try to say with this story is that traffic calming, uh, although often is conceived or perceived as quite complicated, it usually just takes some political willpower and a little bit of engineering. Overall, this is not a very difficult question to solve as long as you have the guts to do it and know the goals that you try to achieve. 
there's just a little bit of context of hardcore traffic calming uh, in the Netherlands, uh, how it can be done. Um, but throughout this presentation, we'll give you a little bit more context about where it comes from um, and about some, some strategies and some tools that you can use to retrofit these kind of treatments to your, um, to your environment. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Mary, who is calling in from Durham, North Carolina. And I hope we can see her now on the screen. You, you don't know how complicated a transatlantic webinar is. There's a lot of tech involved. Mary, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thanks, um, Leonard. We can hear uh, you. So when, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, so when we consider the principles of traffic calming, it's easy to conceptualize them at uh, sort of two different levels, um, the network level or the systems level uh, and the street level. Uh, are we on the slide by any chance that says principles of traffic calming at the top? Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, since we like to say that traffic calming starts at the network level, um, I'll be doing the first half of the webinar kicking off with that. Uh, first, looking at the influence of sustainable safety um, on the Dutch approach to traffic calming. And just a quick sort of note there for the purposes of this presentation, we'll be using sustainable safety, safe systems, and vision zero um, interchangeably. And then next we'll look at when to separate and when to mix related to the functionality of roads. And then uh, last but not least in this first half, we will look at how to use traffic psychology uh, to make road users behave the way you want them to behave. Um, and then Leonard will take us through uh, the street level approaches to traffic calming. Uh, so as many of you know, the Dutch uh, have not always had nicely calmed streets. Um, on our next slide here, uh, you can see that they faced a uh, similar rise in car culture that the states, as well as many other countries did up into the early 70s. And we can really see a parallel there in this graph of traffic fatalities. Uh, it peaks in 1973. And this, uh, this coincides with both more traffic fatalities than the public was willing to accept, including over 300 children. Um, so this, uh, this public pressure, not to mention uh, the oil crisis, was the push that the Dutch government needed to uh, sort of take a more proactive approach to addressing the problem. And as we can see in the chart, uh, the decline in those fatalities is, is quite obvious. Um, so in the 1980s, this decline starts to taper off a bit and the government realized that a little bit more needed to be done. So this is where they start to research and implement what we essentially know as sustainable safety today. So on our next slide here, um, we see that sustainable safety starts with the idea that all traffic fatalities are unethical and therefore preventable. And so as planners, designers, engineers, it's our responsibility to reduce the number and severity of them. Uh, so sustainable safety plays out in a number of ways, of course, uh, but when it comes to infrastructure, one of the most lasting outcomes has been the expansion of 30 kilometer an hour zones. And that's very related to the establishment of this of functional categorization of roads. So there's three different categories with associated speeds, which we'll, we'll sort of get into uh, later, um, but that, that establishment of uh, 30 kilometer an hour zones is due in large uh, part to the research behind this uh, familiar chart on the next slide. Um, so what we're seeing in this figure, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. Uh, this is the influence of impact speed on the probability of death with our solid line um, being the most likely estimate and then our dotted lines showing those 95% confidence limits. So basically what our, our sort of takeaway um, from this chart is that at speeds lower than 30 kilometers an hour here, there is a 10% risk of fatality in a crash. And then above the speed, uh, the risk of fatality there increases exponentially. So what this translates to in terms of sort of safe, forgiving infrastructure um, is that categorization of roadways we refer to uh, that looks like this on our next slide here, uh, where we see a uh, sort of uh, the slide um, with the heading separating and mixing. So in our columns, we have uh, three main roadway functions or categories. Uh, the first being access or local roads. Uh, the second being distributor or connector roads. 
and the third being our through roads. Uh, so the look of this varies a bit from your rural to your urban context, but generally there's a pretty clear uh, design prescription and speed limit, um, speed limit prescription for each of those categories. So a quick note on the speed limits, um, or two quick notes actually. Uh, the first is that the in the Netherlands they're they're quite lucky in that their design and operating speeds tend to match the posted speed limit signs. Uh, so when we refer to speeds, it's it's everything from posted to uh, to how fast people are actually driving on the roads. And then my my second note here is that uh, while these graphics look like U.S. speed limit signs, uh, we do have uh, an international. Uh, audience with us today. So the numbers are all in kilometers per hour. Um, hopefully this is obvious. I haven't, uh, by looking at the 120 mile per hour speed limit sign, thankfully I haven't actually uh, seen any of those in miles per hour. So all the numbers that we're using throughout this presentation are um, metric. So it's easy to think of traffic calming in measures of speed, uh, but we also know that volume uh, traffic volume is also a key ingredient in terms of how calm, how safe, how comfortable um, a roadway feels, particularly from the perspective of someone walking or cycling. So on our next slide here is a, excuse me, a chart of when to mix and when to separate. Uh, so again, generally the rule being to mix at speeds lower than 30 kilometers an hour, again, related to that graph, you can see our, our graph in the top right, and about 2,500 uh, cars per day or average daily traffic. And then above that, you wanna start separating modes out with degrees varying based on, on speed as well as traffic volume. Uh, so uh, once you hit uh, 50 kilometers an hour or about 4,000 cars per day, that's where you really need to, to fully separate your, uh, your cyclists and definitely your pedestrians. There's two other factors uh, to consider in knowing when to mix and when to separate, um, including the width and the weight of vehicles, um, but I think we'll, we'll share that presentation for, um, for another webinar. So going back to, we're going to our next slide. Uh, so we, we look again at our overview of roadway categories, um, this time with the bicycle facility also included in that categorization. Uh, what I think is interesting to note uh, <clears throat> is the lack of painted bike lanes in these categories. Uh, I have pushed many times for an explanation as to, uh, you know, when it's okay for your sort of regular painted, your regular striped bike lanes, you know, sort of when would that be appropriate? As as an American, that that tends to still be the default facility that we that we see here, as well as uh, across other countries. Uh, the best response that I've gotten to that is that painted bike lanes are okay, but not ideal um, on low volume streets, sort of in that 40 kilometer an hour range. Um, so it's, it's really a pretty small window where a regular painted bike lane would make sense. Um, rather, uh, rather the, the preferred option would be to calm traffic more or further separate uh, your modes into that more sort of uh, distinct um, travel lane, separated bike lane and sidewalk. And that, that sort of plays into the intuitive design approach that, that Leonard's going to talk to us about later. Uh, so on our next slide, we're going to be focusing more on the built up area today, even more specifically on 30 kilometer, um, 30 kilometer an hour zones. And this is where uh, I think it gets really interesting. The Netherlands has a modal share of about 27% for bikes across the country. In some areas, this number increases to 60%. So we all know people obviously feel safe enough to ride, it's comfortable, it's easy, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that, that make uh, the Netherlands wonderful. Uh, but, what, why, but what I found surprising is how much other road network actually features dedicated bike facilities. And the answer to that is that it's only 20%. And the reason for that is that the majority of their streets fall into that 30 kilometer zone of traffic home traffic. So again, 80% of roads have people driving slower than 30 kilometers an hour. Um, and my, my next question after sort of letting that settle was how do they get away with that? So they get away with that with a little bit of traffic psychology. 
So on our next slide here, uh, we see uh, traffic psychology for calm networks. Uh, this is a chart uh, 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 called the Staircase of Mundermann, named after Hans Mundermann, the father of shared. Um, hopefully, uh, we you know we want you to remember everything from this presentation, uh, but if not, we really want this sort of um, concept, this slide, to be one of your your major takeaways. Uh, so on the left hand side, on our y axis, uh, we have divisions by road type. We see our three roadway categorizations again. And then on the bottom, we have our duration of travel. And so basically what Mundermann found uh, was that at 30 kilometers an hour in an urban setting or 60 kilometers in a rural setting, people are willing to drive this slowly for upwards of six minutes. Then after that, we need to provide them with a faster route or they're gonna start sort of uh, pushing the speed limit there a little bit. Uh, so then on a distribution road in the built up area, people would be willing to drive at 50 kilometers for up to nine minutes. And then after that, we should really provide them with access to a highway. Uh, so this perception of time is, is quite similar for people on bikes as well. Um, in a primary network for cyclists, uh, this translates to providing a, a mesh width or a priority route in the network, approximately every sort of 500 to, to 700 meters. So when we apply this traffic psychology to the street network on our next slide here. Again, we see that our roads are categorized into a hierarchy of through roads, distributor roads, access roads, um, and each one of these is accessible within those timeframes uh, laid out in Mundermann's staircase. So for example, if you're a, a driver starting out in the, the sort of quadrant of access roads, you should be able to reach a distributor road within six minutes from uh, from pretty much anywhere. And what this does is it allows for these sort of larger traffic calmed islands uh, and therefore eliminates that that need for lots of heavy separated infrastructure. Uh, so despite the majority of streets being traffic calmed, um, people can still move efficiently. They can still get to their destination quite quickly. And let's see, on our next slide here, we are jumping down to uh, Gouda or Hauda in the Netherlands, uh, where they do in fact have a large cheese market. Um, so we're gonna look at how a mobility network was created for, uh, for Gouda. Uh, and one of the first things they did was to really think critically about the way that their city functions, who actually needs access to this space, for what purpose, and then from there, the functions of uh, those necessary roads will, will sort of start to fall into place. So looking at this picture, we can imagine a, you know, a high demand on public space uh, and, and a need for, for quite calmed roads surrounding that area. So on our next slide, uh, we, we should see a map of the pedestrian areas in Hauda. Um, so we're looking at all of our, what we call people places. So these are the areas where people are walking or gathering, where, where that should, should really be the priority. So that red area in the very center is pedestrian only. And then that is surrounded by a 30 kilometer an hour uh, maximum speed sort of city center bubble. And then similarly, we see low speeds in the surrounding um, green residential areas. And then on our next slide, we start to build out the bicycle network. So starting with our blue routes, this is our primary network for people cycling. This is where cyclists have priority, either through a dedicated bicycle street or nice separated cycle track. Um, then we see our green, our green routes. Um, these are our supporting routes, sort of mixed traffic, shared, shared street type atmosphere. And then in red, we have our regional connectors. Uh, so if we think back to our staircase of Mundermann and and thinking about how we determine this mesh width, the distance between these primary networks, uh, there should be a primary, a priority route accessible for cyclists, those blue lines within sort of every six minutes or so. And then on our next slide, we'll look at the car network. Uh, and here you can see that the primary car network is really quite limited. Um, it also sort of parallels the primary bike network, 
so in the downtown area, they're green. They're sort of faster, uh, 50 kilometer routes, um, yeah, quite similar to the bike routes. Uh, and uh, cars are also allowed in most areas within the sort of the otherwise shaded, uh, shaded gray streets. This is as local traffic. Um, but again, it's quite traffic calmed. No through traffic is allowed. Cyclists and pedestrians are, are really determining the speed on, on the streets there. And so on our next slide, I uh, will just do a quick overlay of the pedestrian and car network uh, to get a better sense of, of those traffic calmed areas uh, sort of within the scope of the car network. So all of the green shaded areas are 30 kilometers or slower. Um, uh, but again, then cars have access to their green car network within six minutes. Uh, so we keep our motorists driving uh, happy, slow, and we keep our pedestrians uh, feeling safe and comfortable. Uh, so then we're going to leave Howda and head north to Groningen. Um, so I want to talk in our next slide about just sort of one more little bit of uh, philosophy, I guess, related to our approach to traffic calming. Uh, and that that is that we believe that every street tells a story. Hopefully it's a well-told story uh, and that it's designed to reflect what's going on around it. Uh, so one example would be a highway or a through road. It's really easy to picture a, a landscape around us that doesn't offer much reason to stop. You know, there's plenty of sort of free flowing lanes of traffic to keep us moving. Now let's picture a, a downtown or local access street. Uh, we've got shops and restaurants, um, basically areas that should largely feature people on foot or at least moving slowly if they're biking or driving. Uh, but what we see a lot of times outside the Netherlands is that the design of the road doesn't actually change that much as we hit that sort of downtown area. You know, it, it remains a sort of four or five, sometimes even six uh, lane highway feel going through a downtown so you have shops and restaurants that are telling people to move slowly. And then you have the road telling people to move quickly. There's nothing to see here. So there's sort of a, a mismatch um, in, those, uh, in those stories that they're telling. So on our next slide, uh, where it should say before at the top, um, this is the same picture. Uh, there's, there's no uh, differences you're supposed to see between the two. As a non-Dutch non person, I find it really difficult to believe that this is the before photo. Uh, but when we take a closer look, uh, we do start to see that there's sort of a mismatch between the street's function and the network and its surrounding activities. Uh, so the street is designed to behave more like a distributor road with, uh, with separated bicycle and pedestrian facilities that are sort of encouraging this forward movement and flow. Uh, our driving speeds here are probably closer to 50 kilometers an hour than 30 kilometers. Um, but at the surrounding activities on this street, we have businesses, we have shops, we have restaurants. They're very much um, typical of what you would want your sort of local access street to look like. So the city, they, they decided the activity surrounding the street didn't match the story the road was telling. And so they redid it and presenting us with this after photo. Uh, so now we have much more of a sort of traffic calmed environment. There's still some separation but it's clear that pedestrians have more room, they have the priority at crossings, um, and the speed here of drivers has probably dropped closer to that 30, 30 kilometer an hour um, max. You know, they could probably layer on a few more placemaking elements, but from a, you know, from an infrastructure side of things, they're, they're good. Um, so now this, these stories are, are in agreement. It's an area that's for people walking, it's a destination for people cycling, um, Overall, the city has created uh, a more intuitive space um, by having the street and the surrounding area tell the same story. And with intuitive spaces, uh, we're going to see better behavior and well-behaved road users are certainly something that we're looking for uh, when we think about traffic calming. Um, so now I'm going to hand it back over to Leonard and he is going to take us through these sort of uh, street level elements now that uh, sort of motivate those those uh, slower speeds even further. Um, we, keep, we keep talking about the network being so important even when we talk about traffic calming and that is just because if you don't sort out your network properly you're never going to get the speeds that you want. That staircase of Mondermann, while it's just an example of the way we think about things is, is so crucial in getting people to drive 
the way you want them to drive. But um, in this next section of the, the presentation, I'll talk you through a few of the design elements and of the, 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 the interventions you can do in, at the street level to make sure that people, that drivers mostly behave. Um, so we're gonna talk about, I've got four lessons. I tried to keep it short, but we might go over a little bit. Uh, four lessons, mostly about width, about design, uh, what kind of materials to use, and a little bit about intersections, but not too much, because we cover that in a whole range of other um, master classes. Um, but before we start, I would, I'm interested to see how many people live in cities where, people, where, where the city is actively investing in traffic calming. With, with actively, I mean, they're going in to retrofit existing neighborhoods um, to make sure that, that the speed in those neighborhoods is more appropriate for, um, for the environment that it is. So we have a, another little Mentimeter question, which again doesn't show up on your screen probably, but it does show up on mine. I've got a second screen. You don't know how many screens there are here. Um, we have about a third saying, yes, my city is investing actively. A lot of cities are working on it, which um, sounds like they're doing a lot of studies, but not quite getting it done yet, which may be an indication that they're finding it hard to know how, which is good, good that you're on this webinar. Um, but also about yeah, just under a third or a quarter of responses say no, they're not working on it, which is bad, because <laughs> every city should be working on it. It's a huge challenge to, to retrofit your streets, but I'll give you a few tips on, on how to get it done even in a retrofit situation. So, first lesson. Enforcement is futile. That sounds harsh, but you know, I like to be a little bit harsh. Um, putting up a sign, putting up a speed camera, asking for the police to do uh, speed checks on your, on your 30 kilometer per hour street is not gonna cut it. Um, I will go a little bit further. Dutch streets that are 30 kilometers or less are not policed. Um, the police is of the opinion that if you have speeding on a local street, the design is bad and the city should fix that. It's not their problem to fix because they know enforcement's not gonna cut it. This is a scene from the US where they, they do think enforcement, well, some cities, I'm not gonna blame all of the US, some cities do think enforcement and more signage will solve the problem. And then you get these kinds of atrocities where you just keep putting up reflective signs to try and get people to slow down, uh, put up speed cameras, but all it does is, is uh, anger drivers because they have to remain driving slowly when it doesn't feel right. Uh, the design of the street clearly doesn't match its purpose. So what you need to do is put hard interventions in. Put some, put some stuff on the street that really makes people want to slow down. These are a few of the, of the, of the tools in the, in the palette, um, including uh, diagonal diverters, which are great, where you divert the traffic to, to only be able to turn left or right. Little uh, mini roundabouts, which are very popular in Vancouver, for example. Uh, curb extensions, which we'll cover a little bit further um, in the next a uh, few slides, um, but also the, on, the, on the bottom right, uh, the, the modal filter is very important and very, uh, very popular at the moment because of COVID-19 um, st open streets programs, which is great to see because people will experience their local roads in a very different way because of it. So sometimes you just have to put a lot of stuff on the street to get people to slow down. And sometimes you go this far where there is really no purpose for people to, to drive down the street anymore and you create this kind of open street where the street is no longer a street, but it's a public space. It's an extension of people's houses where people can park their bikes, sit outside uh, and enjoy the neighborhood with their neighbors, which is very, um, you know, that's the goal you want to work towards in some streets, not all streets. Um, also this kind of design where you, where you flip the, the parking from left to right, keep the street very narrow. This really forces people to slow down. It's just a sign in a straight road wouldn't be enough. Um, but you have to have the physical attributes that make people think about how they drive and where they drive and how fast they drive. It's physically impossible to drive very fast on a street like this. Um, so that's a key lesson designed for the behavior that you want. And then probably the most important lesson, uh, width is everything. Uh, a wide road will never be properly traffic calmed. Um, you just need to get those widths down. Some, some cities in the US are, are working on 10 foot lanes. I still even think that's too wide. Uh, you need to make the lane properly wide and I'll give you a few examples. Uh, this is an example from Harlem, um, which is extraordinary even for Dutch principles. You can see the sign on the left that says no wider than two meters, uh, 2.0 meters. It's about the width of a wide car, but a larger truck is banned, not allowed on this street. And you can see cars when they turn into the street, they're going very, very, very slowly 
not because the sign tells them to, but because they're scared to scratch their cars. Uh, if drivers are scared of one thing, it's, it's to scratch or damage your own vehicles. Um, so if you make it uh, narrow enough, it'll work. Another nice example, that kind of um, making the street narrower or reducing the width doesn't have to be very expensive. It can be as simple as putting a rock on the road, either intentional or unintentional. Here's a nice example from the uh, city of Utrecht, where they put two um, poles next to a bridge. They don't want heavy vehicles on this bridge because the bridge is not that strong. Um, and now they've put two, um, two bollards, very, about two meters, 2.1 meters apart. So you can see very wide cars will really struggle um, to get through, which is fine because as soon as they think they can't pass, the first thing they do is they slow down, which is exactly what you want at these dangerous intersection points. Some cities get the message width is important, and they, but they have very, very, very wide roads and they don't know what to do with it, so they think paint will solve it. Um, it helps, but it's not enough. There's an example from New York uh, where they went down from probably three lanes to one, which is fantastic. Uh, they still kept the parking, which is fine. But now you've got these huge wide buffers. Um, by putting the cars in the middle, nobody's really going to feel the need to slow down. If you want, nothing's physically stopping you from driving 100 kilometers an hour down this road. So paint is a good start, but it's never enough to really have enduring change. Now, is it all bad in North America? No, it's not. <laughs> Um, this is a, a photo from Canmore in Alberta. Uh, Alberta is a, the Texas of Canada, as they say. Uh, very large cars, uh, pickup trucks are very common here. Um, and they designed one of their 30 kilometer an hour streets, um, more in the Dutch way, uh, red bike lanes separated with big fat bollards. Um, but the width of the carriageway is only 5.4 meters for bi-directional uh, car traffic. So that equates to about is 16 feet, checking with Mary, it's pretty narrow. <laughs> um, but it works perfectly well. Uh, they took out the center line marking uh, just to give it a little bit of ambiguity. Two cars can pass, but they can only pass very, very, very slowly and very carefully. And what you see is that the operating speed on this street is about 26, 27 kilometers per hour, which is fantastic, even in asphalt, like you don't need bricks. Then the third one, um, an excuse, we can't reduce the speed because the volume is too high. Uh, speed and volume are two very different things. And uh, if you have a high volume, that doesn't mean that you cannot reduce the speed. You just have to be smart about your interventions. We have a few examples uh, in a system that we call driving slower goes quicker. Um, it is a comprehensive street design methodology for high volume, low speed streets. Um, this is one example from, from here in Delft. Um, this carries about 10,000 motor vehicles a day, so it's a reasonably uh, high traffic volume, even for Dutch standards. Um, you can see they put a little uh, raised center marking in instead of paint, uh, which makes people want to drive within that asphalt lane, so they stick to their lane, and that lane is actually um, surprisingly narrow. They do obviously have separated bike lanes because the speed limit is 50 kilometers per hour, even though the design speed is only 40. Uh, so the operating speed will also be closer to 40 than to 50, um, which means a high volume but traffic on street. And then this is the cross section for that street that I just showed you. Uh, you can see the, the driving lane is actually 2.6, 2.60, well, 2.66 uh, meters wide. So it will fit a truck, um, but because of the middle section, which is 65 mils wide, a bit of a buffer between the cars. So they can operate safely. Uh, a fire truck can still race through if they need to. Um, but for normal, normal traffic, they'll feel a little bit crammed in that narrow driving lane, and thus the first thing they do is they slow down. Another example, even more vehicles a day, 12,000 uh, motor vehicles a day on this street, uh, which is in Voorschoten, which I won't test you on. Um, two separated lanes with a wide grassy median, um, continuous flow. There is a traffic light here for the, for the zebra crossing, but otherwise you'll see very few traffic lights on a street like this. So it's optimized for flow, but because the lanes are so narrow, this is 2.9 between the curbs, right? So that's a hard uh, vertical edge on either side, 2.9 meters. There's still a continuous and high traffic flow, but at a reasonably low speed. Then at the intersections, because they're, they're often um, the thing that limits the, 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 the through flow, 
or the throughput of a, of a road. This is the kind of treatment you, you can see here in a more suburban context. Um, a, a very busy, the, the east-west connection very busy, about 12 to 14,000 a day. And this type of intersection, the kidney bean intersection, sometimes called, we haven't quite figured out the, the uniform English name for it yet. Um, but this allows for a high throughput with a big left turn bay where cars can wait uh, to turn left uh, while the, the rest of the traffic can still continue. Um, the downside is that you do, uh, pedestrians and bicycles do yield to these kinds of, uh, on these kinds of roads, otherwise they won't get the car capacity. So this is a road where if you do prioritize car capacity but want to remain or keep the speed low, this is the kind of treatment you can, you can look for. Um, doesn't only work in a rural, um, in rural or in urban conditions. It also works in rural settings. Uh, this is a road in the north of the Netherlands uh, where they have also applied, retrofitted uh, a slightly raised median, which allows for overtaking, but it discourages it. And because of the, the physical narrowing of the road, you'll see that cars drive a lot slower than in other roads, even though um, the speed limit might be 80, but the operating speed will be closer to 60. Um, so the, the, the same principles apply but at a different scale. And then the fourth, um, the fourth principle or lesson for today, the devil is in the details. Uh, design details are very important, especially when you're designing for cycling. Um, and the, the, the things you want to design for a car to slow down the car may also slow down or make it less comfortable <clears throat> for the bike. So for example, most of the 30 kilometer per hour streets, residential streets in the Netherlands will be outfitted in cobblestones or a brick, brick pavers, uh, may or may not look like this. Uh, so a, a pretty wide street with sort of advisory bike lanes, maybe not ideal, but it, it kind of works in, the, in this setting. But if you look a little bit closer, you can see that the pavers are not actually laid in the same way. So a close up of, the, of a similar street like this. On the left hand side is where the, the drivers go with the pavers in a zigzag. Uh, formation and on the right hand side is where the bikes go where the pavers are stacked very close to each other different type of pavers as well it gets a little bit technical um, but it means a much smoother ride for the bikes on the right and a much more um, yeah noticeably uh, bumpier ride on the left which gives a, a straight message to drivers that they have to slow down because they're in a brick street it just gets a little bit uncomfortable for them then we often have this discussion about um, traffic calming and advisory bike lanes, if it works, uh, if it would work in a US context or in a, in a context where you don't have that many bicycles. Uh, this is an example from Utrecht that's often used where the 20% the or 30% of the car traffic evaporated once they lowered the speed limit to 30 kilometers an hour. Um, and they introduced this treatment where there was, there was a, a black asphalt tarmac before. Um, they introduced this, speed went down, car volume went down, bicycle volume jumped by about 20%, even in Utrecht, which already has very high levels of cycling. Sounds fantastic, um, but what we often see is that um, treatments like this get mistranslated and used in a US context, and then, uh, oh, that slide wasn't supposed to be there. Oh, where did my, ah, there we, no. There we go, that slide. Um, this is an application, uh, an early test of advisory bike lanes in the US where they, they get the principles, but there's a lot of design detail that's missing. So there's no red coloring. The, the street is very, very wide. Um, I think this is a, not a great outcome from a traffic calming perspective nor from a safety perspective. So it doesn't deliver the same uh, benefits that you get um, if you don't take care of all the design details. So the four lessons, um, enforcement is futile. Don't rely on traffic signs or speed cameras to, to maintain a lower speed. Uh, width is everything. Uh, make sure that your car lanes are as, as narrow as you can get them. I know there'll be a lot of pushback from safety, safety advocates, maybe even from emergency services, um, but it is extremely important to get the, the, the width to as, as, as little as you can. Um, car volume might be an excuse, but it's not a barrier. Um, you can design high volume, low speed. Um, streets as well, and, and the devil is in the details. So make sure that the, the level of construction is, 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 is high enough, the level of detail and the design is appropriate for um, the outcomes that you want to make sure that it's still comfortable for people cycling. Um, now I can hear you think, yes, okay, but this is all gonna be very expensive to retrofit our entire street network. Um, and we just don't have the money for that. This all sounds like expensive stuff. If you look at these pictures, they have red asphalt, red bricks, uh, all these things that we don't have, and that's true. But um, I think there's three key things that you can use 
in an, any retrofit situation uh, for quite a low at quite a low cost um, to make sure that your current streets, which may be wide, uh, I know still a lot of subdivisions get built with very very wide um, streets. You can set, uh, retrofit those to to fit a lower speed limit with these three tools. Uh, one of them, the diagonal or like a Chicane almost, as soon as the speed limit changes, you often will see a chicane like this in the Netherlands. If you come from a rural environment into a smaller town, uh, there'll be a, a chicane at the entry. Um, the important thing here is that the offset is big enough. So you need to have like a full lane offset, about three, three and a half meters offset to make sure that people cannot speed around it. Um, and this one has um, truck aprons as well. So a big truck can still swing around over that little brick area, but a car will try and stick to the asphalt. So central islets are a great tool to limit the speed at the transition point. Then the second one, the, the raised median, um, slightly raised, it's only like a, a centimeter or two, maybe, maybe three. Um, that's, that's something you can, you can apply within an existing fairly wide street. So the width of that raised median can vary from 20, 30 centimeters all the way to a meter or a meter and a half if you want. Um, but retrofitting bricks onto an asphalt street is a very effective way to reduce the speed because the width will feel much narrower than it was before. And then the last one, uh, we talked about it a little bit, modal filters, uh, very cheap, very, very efficient. Um, and you can make people feel how big the change is in their street just by putting in a bollard or, um, or two. Um, they can be bollards, they can be planter boxes, they can be giant rocks, they can be whatever you want to be as, soon as, it, as long as it physically stops people from driving into that street. Um, we see this a lot with the COVID response. If you want to open street, um, put a bollard in and it's uh, yeah, highly encouraged because it changes the network um, instantly without need, needing a lot of infrastructure. So that was it from us. Um, I hope we have some questions from the audience. Yeah, you, you can still ask questions in the Mentimeter if you want. Um, so far we have, uh, you, why can you not see it here? That's kind of odd, isn't it? Let me click on it. Oh, no, I shouldn't click on it. Can I, can I go to the screen? No, strange. Well, we have a question. Mary, do you want to do questions? She cannot hear me. Yes. Yeah, is it yes, question, it's question time? time. Yeah, let's do some questions. Uh, the first question is, in your opinion, what is the cheapest, easiest to implement and most effective piece of traffic calming infrastructure that a city can install quickly? Wow. I, I have my answer. What is yours? Oh, um, I want to hear yours. Uh, the only thing I can think of, uh, or the first thing that is just filling my mind is that gigantic rock on the slide that you showed. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll keep thinking, but uh, what, what's yours? I was going to say a gigantic rock. Most, most places have gigantic rocks somewhere. Um, just get one, put one on a truck and plonk it into a street. Um, as, as long as you tell uh, the emergency services where you put it, I think you'll be fine. And most residential streets will be able to cope. As long as you can maintain access to a specific street, um, people will be adjusting their behavior pretty quickly. Yeah, big rocks. Maybe we should start a big rock trade. We can ship them to your house. Uh, second question, very little car parking in any of the photos. Uh, where are the cars? Uh, we spent a lot of money in the Netherlands hiding cars underground or behind houses. Um, a lot of the, the, the bigger streets that I showed you don't, don't actually show a lot of cars because the function of that road is flow. Um, so we will reduce the number of on-street car parking uh, on those streets, and then we'll add more car parking at the back, uh, underneath, or tucked away under a canal if you want. Um, but we spend a lot of money on hiding cars, which is not necessarily something I think is a good idea. Oh, I lost Mary in my ear. Um, but we do have very high parking, um, minimum parking requirements in most cities. That was a very Dutch question. Let's see if we can find a Mary question. Here in Ottawa, ah, we are a winter city that needs snow clearing and removal. This leads to challenges with narrowing the streets. Mary, do you have thoughts on snow clearing? Or shall I take this one as well? Um, Leonard, I'll, I'll let you take the, the, <laughs> the snow, snow clearing. clearing thoughts. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that too much. Not too in much Durham. in Durham, North Carolina. Um, uh, Canmore, Alberta has a lot of snow. 
um, they did it. They did it by adding a little bit of buffer space between the car lane and the, and the separated bike lane. Um, they also made the, the bike lane and the footpath at the same level. So in case a little bit of snow from the snow plow plops onto the bike lane, it's not necessarily a huge problem um, because snow, heavy snowfall often is accompanied by lower cycling demand. Um, so that kind of balances out. Um, and otherwise, uh, snow clearing is also often a matter of uh, budgeting um, because there's, there's ways to remove the snow without having to plow it onto the footpath. So there's definitely ways around this or make the median bigger and put all the snow in the median of the street, obviously. Uh, a th uh, this one's for you, Mary. A total 30 kilometer per hour limit, is it a good decision if you don't have any other measures? Your entire city, your whole network, if you make that 30 kilometers. Oh, to have 30 kilometers throughout the yeah. city? Uh, you know, I would say it, uh, if if you don't have any other measures in place, then then just posting the the speed limit of 30k is probably not going to get you there. Um, so it would it would need to be in combination with um, yeah with other measures. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. I, it's it, it can't hurt, but it's not going to get you a lot of benefits probably. Mm -hmm. uh, especially on short. The, there is a similar question on the. Uh, YouTube channel, I think, uh, referring to the pedestrian zone, maybe in, in how to asking if uh, there are lower limits than 30 kilometers an hour. And I do want to address that, that in those pedestrian, uh, pedestrian only areas or pedestrian and cycling areas, um, that that limit is, or the, the speed of traffic is slower. It's more determined by um, pedestrians. They have priority. So yeah, people are driving much more slowly. Uh, I sort of think of it as the parking lot speed. Yeah. And there is a, a legal definition for it within a home zone. Um, I just moved house to a, a place that's technically a home zone. So the speed limit on my new street is 15 kilometers an hour, uh, 10 miles. So it is possible, but they, you don't see too many of those. They're more in yeah, the real residential neighborhoods, mostly built in the 70s. Um, I don't know what they mean with, uh, the, the next question is how do the Dutch deal with their gray roads? I think it is the ones that are in between access and flow. Um, if that's what you mean, I would say make a choice. Go either access or go flow. Um, don't try and avoid yeah. having that ambiguity in the middle. And and that's where I'll add, that's where I, I really push find out where were those areas where your painted, your striped bike lanes would be appropriate. Um, and there is never a sort of definitive answer as to they are appropriate here. It more is sort of classified in that in that gray zone of, yeah. you know, if we get to redo these roads, we will choose if they should be uh, traffic calmed or sort of uh, more more fully uh, separated out. Yeah, exactly. So your your sort of leftover your design leftover, roads. Yeah, leftover. leftover streets. Your leftovers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another question about Groningen. I'll pronounce it for you. You don't have to. Uh, how did they reduce the amount of traffic volume on the street in Groningen so that the traffic calming was effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, question. Um, so my my understanding was that uh, they had the network density of distributor roads. So with uh, with that road being sort of moved towards a, a more local access road, um, people could still reach a larger distributor road within six minutes. So it it wasn't um, uh, too big of an issue when they changed the design of the street. Uh, if if those other opportunities other opportunities weren't there, they would need to sort of rethink uh, traffic circulation. That, that's my understanding yeah. of it. Um, did you have anything to, to add to no, that No, it's true. And, and what we find is that as soon as you lower the speed limit, uh, some of the traffic will evaporate. So you will get um, 10, 20 percent of the traffic just not, not appearing anywhere else in the network. We've done a several case studies that, that show this, this happening. So it does. It is a real thing. Traffic is like water. If you turn up the temperature, it will evaporate. Um, a good question about um, city staff is concerned with keeping the traffic moving on arterial streets. This leads to challenges. Um, there is resistance to installing flexi posts. I think the, the, the trick there is that it's not about um, speed, it's about flow. You want to move people. Uh, moving people is more important than, than how fast these people are going. So that's where the, the, the uh, design concept of driving slower goes quicker. 
it actually has very high volumes, but at a lower speed because 50 is not ideal for, for moving people when you have intersections to deal with. Um, actually, a lower speed is more efficient of moving more people on a, on a street like that. Now, <laughs> there's a question about traffic calming for motorcycles, but I don't know what it means. Do you move car parking away from the curb as an inexpensive way to narrow a road? Or are there not any wide roads left in the Netherlands? <laughs> uh, there's definitely wide roads. Actually, we have the, the widest motorway in Europe, uh, in the Netherlands. We're very proud of that. Um, in the Netherlands, we don't have to move the parking into the road to narrow it anymore. Not very often, not in urban areas. Um, but it is a fantastic way to narrow your street because the, if there's one thing people are scared of is damaging their own car, but damaging somebody else's car at the same time, that's terrifying. So people will want to stay away from those cars. And so if you do have very wide roads, yes, move them in. Mary, what's, the, what's, the, what's your street width <laughs> in your street? Do you know? Have you measured it yet? Uh, the street width where yeah. I live? Is it wide? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's on the it has room for uh, people to park on both sides of the street and two cars to narrowly pass each other. Oh, that's good. It is a uh, we're debating if this is a suburban street or a city neighborhood street. So it's um, it's very very residential. Yep. Um, a lot of a lot of kids playing in the street. Pretty nice. pretty narrowed, and the parking helps. That's yeah. And that's why you move there. Isn't it? Um, here's a question about, is, is the raised median proven to be more effective than a painted median? It is. Um, it is more effective, and we're seeing a lot of um, entities move towards that. I don't have the exact data for you at this very moment, but we can find that out. Uh, the Netherlands uses many bricks. You mentioned a fear of mine that it's too expensive to use in ladies' materials. Are they really more expensive, or is there some economy of scale there? Great question. Bricks in the longer term are cheaper than asphalt um, here in some cities. Uh, one, because there's a lot of people who can lay them, which helps. Two, if they get damaged, you flip them over and they last for another 30 years. Three, if there's anything broken underneath or you want to do work on the, on the pipes or the, the sewer system, you just take out the bricks, dig a hole, fix the pipes, and put the same bricks back. So it's quite... Um, it's quite a durable material that you can use over and over. Um, so the actual life cycle cost is uh, lower for bricks than it is for asphalt. Um, yeah. uh, uh, Leonard, can I also uh, add to that? I, maybe you can um, instruct people on, on what to Google, but it's, it's a little bit of a, a lighter sort of um, infrastructure too. There's these uh, trucks that have... Um, basically like sheets of pavers or sheets of, of bricks sort of, uh, and then as they go along, they're sort of un unrolling the, um, the, the bricks onto the street. Yeah, that's, that's true. We're very efficient. Yeah, that's a good question. Very efficient at uh, laying bricks uh, at the moment. Although those pavement machines, you don't see them that often. <laughs> they, okay. they do good on, well, they do very in... well on Twitter, but you don't see them that much in, in real life. Okay. Um, here's a question about, it's kind of about intersection. It is the last question because it is about, yeah, we're about four minutes away from the end, which is perfect. Um, last question is, can you touch on signalization as a means for traffic calming on arterials and corridors where other physical design elements are not fitting or possible? That is a great question. Mary, what do you think? Um, you know, I think, and maybe you had this uh, in, in one of your other webinars, Leonard, uh, but we, we, would not opt for signalization um, too often if you're if you're thinking about traffic calming. Um, it's uh, largely because we're it doesn't contribute as much to safety. So if we're thinking about calming traffic, it's really very closely tied into that uh, safety aspect of it. Um, yeah, I'll I'll let you. Yeah, it, from it, it depends on what your goal is. Like if you're if your goal is to, to slow down the cars and there's not actually that many people crossing, it can be quite effective to just make the traffic lights very annoying. Um, but you should be careful about 
uh, letting a lot of pedestrians or bicycles cross that road at the same time because it's not going to give them the, the same level of protection as a roundabout, for example, would be. Because the roundabouts, well, came, coming back to designing the hardware to fit the, fit the use, you physically cannot drive very fast through a well-designed well uh, roundabout. Um, but you can travel very fast through a well-designed traffic light because nothing's physically stopping you. So yes, a, a roundabout would do better. Traffic lights, I, I've just been driving a uh, moving house of German quite a lot uh, through Utrecht. And Utrecht has horrific traffic lights, and I think they do it on purpose. So if you have a lot of lights that are red all the time, they do slow you down a lot and just make driving really, really annoying, um, which can be great, but it might backfire because people will start running the lights and then you get into more trouble when there's pedestrians crossing, for example. So from a safety perspective, try and put in physical elements that slow people down and not rely on signage or traffic lights alone. But it's complicated. Um, so with that, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, there's 15 more questions, but we'll have to save them for the next webinar. These webinars are only the, the, the first tip of the iceberg to, to really get to know um, our thinking and the way we, we do things um, at Mobicon. Two more things to tell you. Um, the first one is that if you like the way we think and you are running, uh, for example, a complicated project, um, there's uh, some, some input that you would like, but you don't know, you want some questions answered. We have a, a the Mobi Coach uh, program where it's basically just having a, a Dutch designer on call where you can, uh, we can schedule uh, several calls over a, a, a period of time where you can just ask us any question that you have um, about traffic coming or about intersection design or about communication or about education, Every, everything that you are interested in from the, from the Dutch. Uh, mobility expertise, you can have a Dutch person or a Dutch mobility advisor on call. So send us an email if you're interested in that. It is very affordable for the time being. It might be a little bit too affordable. And then um, the last slide is to th thank you very much. If you enjoyed this webinar and you want to be kept up to date about future webinars, the best way to do that is to um, register for our newsletter on our website, mobicon.com. Um, search for newsletter there and you'll be able to find it. Um, and then we'll send you an email so you can be the first to register for the next one, um, as long as these are free, which may not be forever, just warning you. Um, so thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Mary, for joining us from North Carolina. Um, this was technically quite a challenging webinar, but I think it went well. Um, so thanks for joining us. Thanks, Melissa, for introducing us. And thanks to our technical team for making this all happen. And we'll see you at the next webinar in a few weeks. <laughs> Subscribe to the newsletter and we'll tell you exactly you. what it is. Thank you and see you later.